one of the most notorious arm wrestling leagues ever, spawned from a reality TV show. The WAL was arguably ahead of the pack as far as production value is concerned. It featured big names in the arm wrestling community and often offered the biggest cash rewards in the world of arm wrestling at that time. Presenting itself as an easy to digest super match extravaganza made for TV, it often served the role as entry point for the modern arm wrestling fan. With all this attention and bravado also came a healthy amount of scrutiny, sometimes even from veterans in the sport. With the World Arm Wrestling League having tentatively announced their imminent comeback, it appears to be the perfect time to take a closer look. I am the Arm Historian, and today I'll be your tour guide as we examine the birth and life of the World Arm Wrestling League. As with most arm wrestling leagues, it's important to realize that usually there is one individual that serves not only as the catalyst, but also the major driving force behind the birth and further success of the league. Of course, it's worth noting that a slew of crew members and all sorts of production staff, as well as talented arm wrestlers, ultimately make the league into what it is. The man behind the curtain in the case of Wall is definitely Steve Kaplan. Steve was born in March of 1960 somewhere in Illinois, USA, and didn't seem to come from an affluent family. When Steve was 10 years old his parents split up and his mom was left to raise him and his two siblings on her own. Steve would later go on to say he owes a lot of his success in life to his mother and the amazing work ethic she showed to provide for him and his sisters. Steve Kaplan put for himself the goal of being able to retire at the age of 35. To realize this lofty goal, he decided to attend business school. Shortly after graduating, Steve decided to start his own business from scratch. He later said that during this time, he would often be living out of his car while trying to make ends meet. Despite his daily financial struggles, he quickly realized he possessed quite a knack for selling and ultimately building a business from the ground up. After the success of his first company, Steve decided to sell it for a hefty profit. The company ended up being worth about $20 million, a large sum for the fledgling businessman. Wanting to pass on all the experience he had accumulated, as well as possibly finding a new revenue stream, Steve decided to put pen to paper and went on to write and publish three books. The books all centered around building up a business, keeping and acquiring customers, and eventually selling your business. They did quite well, especially within the niche he was targeting, being translated into 10 different languages and sold in 40 countries. It seems Steve wasn't content with his accomplishments quite yet though. In the following years he continued to build up a solid portfolio as a shrewd businessman, acquiring and selling multiple companies, as well as cultivating a side hustle as a public speaker. His talks were mostly motivational in nature and often touched on how to start and build a business while believing in yourself. By the time the new decade rolled around in 2010, Steve had made a life for himself in the Chicago suburbs, having one of his homes there along with his two children. Two years on, he would feature in an episode of the show Secret Millionaire, where he would dress up like an average show and go to good causes around the area under the guise of being a documentary filmmaker. At the end of the episode he would reveal himself to be a multi-millionaire and donate a substantial amount to the charities. In 2014 Steve Kaplan was working as a consultant on several television productions. And after returning from US military bases in Iraq, where he was giving talks to soldiers about how to start their own business, he became enamored with the sport of arm wrestling. He had seen soldiers using arm wrestling to blow off steam and getting really competitive while doing it. Steve then became involved with the production of a brand new arm wrestling reality show, commissioned by US-based television cable channel AMC. The show would become known as Game of Arms and featured several teams consisting of competitive arm wrestlers, facing off in a tournament-style show. If you want to learn more about Game of Arms as a whole, I recommend you watch my video on it. The important thing for today's topic, however, is that after Game of Arms Season 2 got cancelled by AMC, Kaplan's love for arm wrestling remained. It soon became clear that he would do everything within his power to get competitive arm wrestling on TV again and by extension would try his hardest to propel the sport to mainstream appeal. 
As would be expected from someone who had significant experience in the television realm, Steve Kaplan decided the best course forward was to partly self-fund and produce a made-for-television show about competitive arm wrestling. Instead of going for the reality TV route, however, as before with Game of Arms, he decided instead to shoot for another network. The American, globally renowned and syndicated TV network ESPN2 would soon be found worthy of Kaplan's lofty goals. In 2014, shortly after Game of Arms, Steve Kaplan somehow succeeded in convincing AMC to at least partly sponsor the very first WoW tournament. He took with him Bart Wood as head referee, a man he had become closely acquainted to during Game of Arms, and also commentator Neil Pickup, who had by then proven to be a capable announcer and commentator on Arm Wars. Bart Wood's reffing style, as well as Neil's signature banter and one-liners, would become a mainstay of the league as both men stayed with it until its ultimate demise. This first ever wall tournament took place in March of 2014 in Ohio. It was decided Wall would organize a total of four tournaments throughout the year, which would lead up to a big finals event. Participating in this event would be arm wrestlers that qualified by making it to the top eight in any of the four previous tournaments. Only this grand final event would be aired on ESPN2 that year and would take place in New Orleans. Cash prizes for the event would total a whopping $150,000, divided amongst the top 8. The winners of their class, who would each receive 10 k included notable pullers like Yanis Amelins, Dodzilla, Marcio Barboza, Dave Chafee, Devin Lerat, Paul Talbot and Travis Bajan. When looking at the rest of the roster, it was clear that quite a number of the pullers from Game of Arms found their way into the finals too. I spoke to Arm Wrestling veteran, member of the Ottawa High Hookers, and owner of the website Arm Wrestling Archives, Eric Roussin, who remembers this period well. I remember that pretty much on short notice, a tournament was organized in Columbus, Ohio, and that was within a few weeks of Game of Arms first appearing on TV. And it was promoted as a big money tournament. There would be a series of, I think, three or four tournaments that year that would culminate the final tournament with $150,000 in prize money. But that first event, I think people didn't really know how legitimate it was, but it sounded pretty good because it was associated with AMC. So it did get a good turnout and a couple of international pullers attended as well. Once that was a success and everyone got paid and everyone had fun and, and everything, soon after they announced the second big event which was the las vegas event in i think june of that year and that that one they really pushed and that one everyone realized okay this is serious the the world arm wrestling league is is going to be is something big and that tournament was a, a huge success uh, i don't know how many competitors there were several hundred for sure and that was the first one i went to after the initial success of the league's first year, it seems owner Steve Kaplan was not content with keeping the scope at the same level for the next year. He proclaimed the events taking place in 2015 would be even more plentiful and bigger. This time he planned on organizing a hundred local qualifying events throughout the first half of the year, culminating in a two-day grand championship in Las Vegas in July of that same year. Eventually, with the help of local organizers, 72 local qualifiers took place throughout the US and Canada. The WAL was also an early adopter of social media within the arm wrestling world. The WAL YouTube channel was started in August of 2014 and posted for the first time in September of 2014. Their website wallunderground.com launched around the same time with the first traces of it appearing on the 12th of July 2014. This first iteration of the WAL website also included links to various other social media accounts. The final event of 2015, hosted in Las Vegas, lasted a full two days and paid out an even bigger amount than the previous edition. First place winners of each weight class would receive $20,000. Notable winners from this year include John Brzezink, Devin Lerat, Yanis Amelins, Paul Talbot, amongst others. Additionally, Wall expanded its women's division and paid out the top four of each weight class. Even Jody Lerat, wife of Devin Lerat, and now famous side of the table. Uh, it's off the front of the pad right now. It's good. Put it on yeah. the pad and keep it down. His elbow. 
a supporter, makes an appearance in the top 4 with both hands. The married pair would go on to feature heavily in future editions of Wall, sometimes focusing heavily on the pair's banter and Jody's sometimes somewhat excessive cheerleading. A large number of local qualifiers were promptly organized throughout the US and Canada to feed into the next 2016 finals that were to once again take place in Las Vegas on June the 24th. One of those local organizers who would go on to organize a qualifying event the following year was future wall competitor and current rising star of the professional arm wrestling world, Paul Lin, who talked to me about his experience. So at that time, they were allowing basically anyone who wanted to apply to be a tournament director to do so, just with a few stipulations like they were going to take half of the entry fees, but they were going to provide you with awards and you didn't really have to promote because it's a qualifier and people have to get qualifications. So we hosted one at a, like a, lo a local social club, the Sons of Italy, small place, great turnout. The environment was was mega and like having hosted a bunch of tournaments afterwards i realized like the value of these qualifiers you know we have the east versus west qualifiers going on now they're self-promoted events like you don't have to do all the social media and like brag about your awards and everything you're providing people are coming and they're on a mission anyway even though Wall had always accepted international entries into its tournaments before, the organization decided to put a larger emphasis on building up international relationships between pullers. Subsequently, it decided to organize qualifying tournaments in Germany, Sweden, Norway and Australia. The 2016 Wall Grand Final included an amateurs division held the day before the pro division matches and several workshops on several arm wrestling and strength training topics. The following two days were filled to the brim with high-caliber armlessing matches, culminating in an after-party on Sunday evening. The cash payouts would once again be substantial, but would ultimately be reduced to $10,000 for every first-place winner. Notable winners from this year would include Tony Kitowski, Todzilla, Devon Lerat, Travis Bajant and Nicholas Nanestad. Impressively, Devon Lerat as well as Travis Bajant won first place in both the left and right hand in the heavyweight and super heavyweight divisions respectively. The women's division paid out $2,500 to its first place competitors and saw the dominance of Fia Rysek on both hands in the middleweight division. In 2017, WAL organized their usual qualifier events, most domestically, as well as introduced tournaments that they would call Majors. These tournaments had a payout of up to $350 and seemed to function mainly as an intermediate final. A total of four of these would be organized. With the big finale announced to take place on the 29th of June once again in Las Vegas, qualified athletes were gearing up for another unforgettable and potentially lucrative edition of the WAL Finals. The event did turn out to be unforgettable, but in a way no one expected. Um, and then the final was, gonna, was supposed to be as big as all the other finals, but unfortunately uh, some deals, partnership deals fell through at the last minute. So the, the event was canceled less than two weeks before the final date. And then all of a sudden it was back on, but you know, for much less money. Indeed, wall sponsors seemed to have pulled out at the last minute, prompting Steve Kaplan to cancel the event a mere week before it was to take place. A lot of athletes had already planned their trip and decided to go ahead with the tournament in a more rudimentary form. Frank and Karen Bean and Travis Bajan really saved, saved the show. Now the payouts weren't the same, but they found a way to pay out. I think first place was like a thousand bucks and they paid down to like fourth. They raised the money to do it. It was basically kind of crowdfunded, replicated the hammers too. Some straggling wall crew members and referees helped the still attending athletes turn the impromptu tournament into a worthy one. Footage of the makeshift event can still be found online. The arm wrestling community was up in arms. Like they're so jaded, they took it so personally. But from a business perspective that I also understand, this is a guy who likes arm wrestling, but he's not an arm wrestler. He's not doing what Angan Terzi's doing. There was no pay-per-views, there's nothing like that. This was solely a business endeavor that required sponsorship and mutual benefits. 
So without the sponsorships, there is no finals. And yeah, they, like, does it suck to find that out a couple weeks before? Absolutely. Were the pullers screwed? Sure. But again, it's business, you know? So it, it, it is what it is. There were so many pullers upset. Like, well, why didn't Steve just... After some time of radio silence on the part of Wall, it seemed big changes and new events were on the horizon. Wall had announced a new partnership with Bleacher Report Live. BR Live had been involved in the airing and streaming of several high-profile sporting events and looked to be the perfect partner for Wall. With this new development in production came a major change in the way matches were organized. Gone were the days of qualifiers and structured multi-day events. New era of super matches had arrived. From 2018 onwards, Wall focused mainly on invitation-only super matches. While it did still organize some smaller scale tournaments that usually functioned as a way to find new talent, it was clear that the landscape of Wall had changed dramatically. Over the next two years, Wall went on to organize dozens upon dozens of super matches between what they touted were the biggest superstars of arm wrestling at that time. An even bigger focus than before was put on watchability and entertainment value. Considering the league had become invitation only, it might not surprise you that most of the participants were or quickly became big names within the arm wrestling world, a lot of them having gained notoriety from the tournament era of WoW. Michael Todd, Jerry Catteret, Sam Harris, Rob Vigent, Justin Bishop, Gabby Vasconcellos, Jeff Hale, Hermes Gasparini and Matt Mask were only a few of the pullers that come to mind when one thinks of the super matches organized by Wall during this time. Perhaps fitting, Wall's last listed event is the Super Match Showdown that took place on September the 25th of 2019 and featured the heavily controversial match between Monster Michael Todd and Jerry Catteret. The conclusion of the match left viewers shell-shocked as a self-righteous Michael claimed himself victorious and walked off the stage. Perhaps showcasing the duality of Wall best, earlier in that same event, Devin Lerat faced off left-handed against the always entertaining Wagner Bortolato, which made for an awesome match. I asked you, my dear viewers, for some input on your favorite and most controversial matches of Wall's illustrious history. Here are some highlights of your favorite picks. It's clear the controversial ending to the 2017 Wall season, as well as the rise of the Supermatch era, played a role in the disillusionment of the league's core audience, as well as its inevitable downfall. However, other factors surely contributed to its tragic fate. By the time Covid swept the globe, Wall was making plans and was seemingly advertising their next big slew of Supermatches. Juji Mufu, who was by then falling in love with the sport, to feature in a Supermatch with Mike Aiello. Even though the match was lauded as mostly for show, it seems clear Wall wanted to cash in on the building hype. As if somehow aware of me making this video, Mike Aiello recently commented on a post I made on Instagram, basically fessing up to the whole match being scripted. However, communication from the league would soon stop and prospective matches seemed to die down. With other leagues seemingly thriving in this new era of arm wrestling, Wall seems to have spent most of its resources and time into supporting some of these leagues, with them sponsoring early editions of Larry Wheels, King of the Table. Additionally, some smaller scale tournaments seem to have been organized by, or at least have some affiliations with, the league. 
Apart from that, all was quiet on the wall front. A major point of criticism that is often lobbed at Wall is that the League never offered the opportunity for any of the top Eastern armor stores of the time to pull. Indeed, despite claims from Wall announcer Neil Pickup and regular attendee Devin Larratt, it seems that entry for pullers from some countries was nigh impossible during the tournament era of Wall. Despite several European qualifiers being held in and before 2016, pullers were only allowed to participate if they were a resident of the country the qualifier was held in, or in some cases, a select few of the neighboring countries. Even if, and this seems to be a big if, some local qualifiers in North America were open to anyone to enter, the logistical and financial burden would have made it nigh impossible for certain Eastern pullers. Another point of contention seems to be the rule set and non-conforming tables the World Armoring League utilized in its tournaments, as well as its super matches. Running fouls were introduced to the rules, as well as bigger elbow pads. These changes would seemingly be made to cut down on matches ending in fouls, as well as to improve the general flow of a match. The WAL received a lot of praise as well as criticism from fans and arm wrestlers alike for its way of operating. Its representation of arm wrestling as a legitimate sport seemed, according to some people, hampered by the loose rule set, dramatic framing of the matches, and ultimately led the league to be painted as a circus by some spectators. One other, admittedly small, factor that might have contributed to this view of the league was its seemingly partly hired and paid audience. There were always knocks about like them having like fake crowds and things like that, um, but that was part of it. So that was part of the whole ambiance. I think they were trying to create somewhat of a WWE feel with actual competition. And depending on where they had that qualifier, people were like, oh, those are fake fans. Not nah, like 50 to 60 percent of them, a lot of times, are just people who are arm wrestlers who bought a ticket to go. Recently, some glimmer of hope might be appearing in the void left by the World Arm Wrestling League. A social media account run by Wall has uploaded the rather promising but ultimately insubstantial message Big things coming, hashtag Wall. Additionally, on the 2nd of February of this year, Big YouTuber Chris Hiria did a feature on Alan Fisher. In the video, Alan mentions in passing the return of Wall later this year. It's really huge. Right now, the WAL, the World Arm Wrestling League, they'll be making their comeback this year. And then you got the East vs. The World Arm Wrestling League will forever hold a special place in the halls of arm wrestling history, arguably the most casually accessible iteration of any of its predecessors. It invariably inspired a lot of new viewers to follow the sport, as well as compete themselves. A lot of money and certainly passion was put into this grand endeavor, and although it had its fair share of criticism, false promises, and ultimately seems to have petered out, I for one hope it will soon be back to entertain us once again. Thank you for watching the very first episode of Birth of a League. I would appreciate it if you top rolled the like button and maybe drag the subscribe button deep inside into a loving hook that lasts for many years. A special thank you to Mr. Eric Roussin for lending me his time and invaluable knowledge. Also a big shout out to Mr. Paul Lin for lending me his expertise for this video. Arm Historian, out.